You're going to remember this every day for the rest of your life. If you want to get to a goal, if you want to get to your dream, you've got to focus on all the little steps. You have to put in your time. You have to be patient and you have to enjoy the process. Whatever you're doing now, whatever you want to be great at, whatever you want to be special at, I'm sure you, you may be already be good at it, but to be extraordinary, you have to do extra. I firmly believe that we are all here for a very specific reason, to do something truly extraordinary. But what are you going to do to get there? So once again, thank you for being on the show, Mike. You're the man. My pleasure. Um, appreciate it. We, we've had some uh, great chats at dinner. Mm. And I know we're also uh, food specialists, <laughs> specifically eating. But Mike also has a specific skill in actually cooking. So um, I lean on him to say we're available to come over and eat <laughs> at any time. Invite's always open. What's your specialty when you cook? Hard to say, man. But overall, Italian. That's my. That's You're not my Italian, good. are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, overall Italian, and then also my steak game is on point. Really? Yeah, yeah. You got to come over for steak or for lamb, some roasts. Really? I'll, I'll roast a mean lamb shoulder. Wow. Yeah. So you, the the door is open. You that's just let me know when. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Appreciate that very much. So I connected with Mike um, at Anatomy. And I heard so many things about anatomy, I had no idea who Mike was, but everything I heard about him was ultra positive. And coming from people who I think, in all seriousness, you just connected within the club, which is not mm. surprising because he's such a friendly, open individual. But then I started to hear, you know, he, you do coaching, you have uh, groups of men uh, that you mentor and lead and, and just guide them and support, and I thought, it sounded nothing but ultra positive, and mm. I'm like, man, I want to meet that guy. And Mike is an awesome member of our community at Anatomy. He's a training, fitness, workout guy, but he's also heavy into helping people. And I think that's the most wonderful part of Mike, if you don't mind me saying. Appreciate it. So tell us about your background, and, and so we could segue into this, because I want to hear all about the book and all about these groups that I've heard so much about. I appreciate you having me on, and it's always always great to spend yeah. time with you. Of course, man. The, uh, you know, I was born and raised in New Jersey, great family, great brothers, great mom and dad. I was an athlete when I was young, and then, you know, that was always my identity, was, was athletics, was sports, baseball and basketball. And then as I got older, you know, my, fam my mother and father split up, I got an injury, and overnight it felt like my whole identity changed. I couldn't, I couldn't, work, you know, train. I couldn't work out. I couldn't play basketball. And I remember as, a, as I was young, I was a teenager, and I remember starting to think like, well, if I can't play sports, who am I? What am I? What's my function? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I started at a really young age, 14, 15. Started really getting into mindfulness. Really getting 14, into, 15. 14, that's young, 15, man. That's sit, young. Sitting in. What, what triggered it? I, I think I, my life was in turmoil. You know, my whole family identity and my whole athlete identity flipped upside down within weeks. And were you, were you, you were dealing with stress like via sports, but you, we, did you have like, I'm sure you had, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. What was your upbringing like in, or family environment like? And did that, was that a little bit chaotic, which helped you seek that or not necessarily? You know, I think looking back, I, I realized that it was chaotic, but for me, it was normal. It was like a fish being in water. So I didn't see my parents splitting. Understood. I didn't see it coming. Okay. So I was kind of shocked by it. And I was going into... It'll do that. It'll, <laughs> it, it'll upend things, oh, right? Yeah. And so I was going into, you know, into high school. I was going to an all-boys school. Everything was changing in this one summer. And my life just went from totally solid and foundational to complete upheaval. And then we just struggled financially. My parents were split. My brother moved out to college. I wasn't playing sports anymore. I mean, it was two weeks that my whole life just went, took a radical trajectory. And I found a lot of solace, like being outside in nature, hiking, always loved hunting and fishing when I was a kid. That was the way my father and I connected. Mm -hmm. And then I just started reading more and more about like inner work and mindfulness and nature and Native American philosophy. At 15, 16, I'm sitting in my first sweat lodge as a kid oh, wow. in New Jersey. That's wild. So my life took this crazy turn as a youth that went from athletics to 
you know, mindfulness mm -hmm. and inner awareness. Mm -hmm. Then I went, uh, took a train across the country when I was 17. Of course, 17. For <laughs> It's a great idea. For 30 days, I went all over the country. Just on your own? Me and three buddies. Okay. And I, I look back now, I'm like, how did my parents ever say yes to this? Did they? They obviously they did. They did. Yeah, they knew about it. They actually approved it. As long as I came up with the money, they were like, do whatever you want. That's impressive. I, I don't know a parent today that would let their kid no, do this. No way. That's a suicide mission. <laughs> <laughs> 30 days, man, like <clears throat> eating peanut butter and jellies. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm rubbing two nickels together. But I land in San Francisco, hike in the Sierra Nevadas, go up to Seattle, and then I wake up one morning on the train in Glacier Park, Montana. I thought I died and went to heaven. Explored Montana, loved it so much, took the train back to New Jersey, filled out a college application to Montana. I'd never even seen the university. Got accepted two weeks later, bought a pickup truck and drove back there. So just so I could rock climb and fly fish and be outside. So immerse, right? all of this, like this was my youth, filled with freedom, filled with like, just go explore, go find whatever truth it is you need to find. And luckily my parents were, I don't know if they were supportive of it or they were just like at their last rope. Right, right, right. So I was like, you know what? You're the third of three. Just raise yourself at this point. <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> they were gassed out at this point. <laughs> so this was like my youth. And when I came back from college, when I came back from Montana, I came back to New Jersey and I got a job working for my uncle three days out of college. And I was, we, we, my family always struggled financially growing up. And my uncle owned this really successful corporate event planning business. And he said, why don't you come work for me? We'll travel the world together. Mm -hmm. So a 22 year old who's, you know, scraping quarters together. This guy makes an offer to me and says, if you successful at it, my son doesn't want the company. Why don't I groom you to take it over? So I'm in my twenties. <laughs> totally seduced by this like potential yeah, of a possible. lifestyle okay. i remember the first trip we went was las vegas and I, oh, I remember thinking like you're paying me to be here and do this right now this is incredible so i came back and i, I was so broke i didn't even have a cell phone i had to call my mom collect remember collect calls oh i do call the rock taking away back kids we'll put that <laughs> in the show notes so you understand what a click call is so the, i blinked and my 20s went by and I just went down this hole of like being seduced by money and status and I mean I was traveling the world and making money and driving the Mercedes and owned my own home in my 20s, vice president of the company. Wow. On paper my life looked amazing, mm -hmm. but deep down I was so unfulfilled. I wasn't making any impact at all and I had this youth of like freedom and mm -hmm travel and adventure and inner work mm -hmm. and then I was in my 20s with like what am I doing I'm just living you know stockpiling mm -hmm. money but I'm making no impact no difference right so later in my 20s I uh I looked at my uncle one day and like I was getting stressed out and over you know I was gaining weight and me and Jason Ferrugi our, yeah, our right, mutual right. friend course, we were living in New Jersey at the time we started he got me really into weight training I started to recapture my health. I started to dial in my nutrition, change my whole lifestyle. And finally, like all these people in my office were like, what are you doing? You look great, your energy's amazing. And I just started, I started to coach them in my office. I How did that start? I didn't even know coaching was a thing. This is like 15 years ago. All right, so tell me about like coaching. Yeah, now it's like an explosion. I got right. a consultant for my coffee. It's like, <laughs> how do I get to work? You got a consultant for that. You got to talk to your coach, get in the car. But we'll cover that. How did you, how, your first experience coaching someone in the office and it started like you know, super weird and random, but tell us about that first interaction, that first person. Biggest one I still remember was... I was losing all this weight and my energy was great and people in the office were just like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. I need to do what you're doing. So I would tell them about the foods I was eating and all natural foods and fasting and juicing and all the, you know, just really talking. It was just conversation. Months go by and I'm at a company Christmas party and I'm coaching really, there's a lot of women in my office, so I was coaching them. They were all interested in what I was doing. We're at a company Christmas party, and this gentleman comes over, 
And he says, are you Michael? I said, yeah. He says, I want to shake your hand. You've changed my life. I don't even know who this guy is. It was one of the women's husbands. And he said to me, my, my wife comes home and she does all these things that you keep telling her about it at the office and cooking all these foods and we've changed our lifestyle and I joined like a biggest loser at work. He worked in like a warehouse. Wow. And we had this contest and I just did all the stuff my wife was telling me to do because of you. And I'm 53, I have no joint pain. I lost 30 pounds last year and I just enrolled into the Boston Marathon. I'm gonna run the Boston Marathon oh my at 53. Gracious. You've changed the whole trajectory of my life. I never even met the guy. So I'm like blown away with possibility, right? So I'm in, I feel stuck in this corporate environment, but what really lights me up is making impact and coaching. And this is before coaching was really even an industry. So now I'm like, how do I make this what I do? Like, how could I actually make a lifestyle and earn a living and, and merge together my profit and passion? Do what you love. Do what you love. I mean, it's bumper sticker wisdom, but then it's like, well, what are the mechanics behind that? So I remember being at this like crossroads of my life where I'm like working for my uncle who I love and I'm being groomed to take this company over. Then there's this passion that I have about really inspiring and improving people's lives. And eventually it, it converged and we, I was at the dinner with my uncle and he was like, listen, I feel like your heart's not in this business anymore. It was like this really tough conversation. He could see it, though. He could feel it. He could see it, mm -hmm. man. Like, it was written all over my, my vibe. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, I got to be honest with you, it's not. And he said, if you could do anything, what would you do? And I said, this is going to sound strange, but I want to I help people put their health and happiness back together. And he goes, how are you going to do that? And I was like, I don't know, but I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty committed to figuring it out. Right, right. And his response was, well, when that doesn't work out, I'll just leave a position open for you at the company. Oof. And all I heard, though, was you go for it. it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, he was telling me, like, this will never work. But I was like, as soon as I was honest with him, mm -hmm. I was like, let's go for it. He's like, just let's go. So I ended up building over the time and mistakes and failure, but staying committed and staying passionate. And I mean... I think five years went by, I blinked, and I was like, I can't believe this is my life. I can't believe this is what I get to do and the impact that I get to make. That's wild. That's super wild. It's, uh, you know, I think I was thinking about your story as you were walking me through. Now, you didn't even directly coach that gentleman that you changed his life. That just shows people, we always tell our team, you have no idea who's watching. No idea. You have no idea who you're influencing, good or bad. You're influencing someone. 24 7 you really are you know so there's no way around it you imagine I think correct me if I'm wrong the possibilities of you directly coaching them in the effect you would have when you're sitting in front of them you know right it's, it's unbelievable but I'm guessing Mike how did you feel like the amount of fulfillment you know you I've heard my mentors say the only true fulfillment you get in life is from helping others mm. And automatically you felt a sense of purpose and fulfillment, right? You're immediately being a contribution. Mm -hmm. Because here's the thing, like, and, I, and I, I think for all young coaches, I always say this for young coaches, mm -hmm. always start with your own direct experience. What you used to struggle with or what was a frustration? What did you learn and implement to solve it? And how do you live now? So at first, all the people I was coaching, I'm just speaking from my own experience. Mm -hmm. I was stressed out. I was gaining weight. I was miserable. I felt mm -hmm. stuck in my business or in my career. And this is what I did to get out of it. So I was, day after day, I was only speaking of my own experience. Everyone is an expert in their own experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one can challenge your experience. So at first, I was just talking about and coaching on these are the things I've overcome. What was so fulfilling for me was that having the courage to overcome some of those things that I felt trapped in was actually making this incredible experience and, and contribution in other people. So it, it made or almost even validated the struggles that I went through overcoming them. It, it now became an impact on other people's lives, which ended up becoming like 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't reverse that. I wouldn't change that. I would go through it again because look at my own direct experience and the impact it's making on people. Mm -hmm. Then over time, after coaching hundreds and hundreds of people, I really find, I finally started to find that the niche that I loved coaching was men because I could relate to the struggle. We spoke similar languages, similar stresses, similar frustrations. Mm -hmm. That's when I really started to dial into okay, this is my direct experience. There's a lot of men that are stressed and overwhelmed and feel stuck in all domains of life or in several domains of life. And this is what I've done. Mm -hmm. And this could be a contribution to your life. Mm -hmm. And if it is, so be it. Let's work together. If it's not, God bless you. Mm -hmm. Keep doing what you're doing. And little by little, it just it created a, a lifestyle that... I remember 15 years ago, I sat on the edge of my bed and, and I was like, this can't be my life out of total stuckness and mm -hmm. frustration. And now I sit at the edge of my bed and I'm like, I, this can't be my life. How did this happen? This is mm -hmm. amazing. But I look back and I made conscious choices, took conscious action, took full responsibility and accountability for my life. And I noticed, I was like, listen, if I'm in a hole, the only one that's going to get me out is me. Yeah, that's powerful. <clears throat> one of my coaches uh, growing up told me once, you know, we always have this thing in the back of our minds that we believe that someone's going to show up to save us and create this awesome opportunity for us and tell us, like, look, I'm going to mentor you. It doesn't work like that, man. It's yeah. you. You're it's responsible you. for you. At the end of the day, like, that's the most, in my opinion, I completely agree with you and your mentor. It's the most liberating and scary statement that you could say in your life. It's all on me. Mm -hmm. It could be completely liberating, like, all right, it's all on me. If I'm in this ditch, I'm the one that gets myself out. And for some people, it's it just so daunting that my, my suggestion is always just take a deep breath. If you're in a hole, rule number one, stop digging. Just stop digging. Whatever's causing all the hole and the harm, first just pause on that for a moment. Mm -hmm. And just one thing at a time. One breath at a time, one step at a time. My father uh, was, my, I lost my father a few years ago to pancreatic cancer. He had it for Sorry. eight years. Appreciate it. Mm. And I remember like when he was diagnosed, it was so daunting. And then we started to, my father and I started to develop this theme that when life puts a mountain in front of you and you can't get around it and you can't get over it, you lean on it and you push it. And inch by inch, you just push it, push it, lean on it and push it, push by push, inch by inch. And my father moved a mountain for eight years, eight years, eight eight time, years that's with pancreatic cancer. And I remember I, that's what I spoke at his funeral was that's what he taught me. Like, don't think it's going to be this big biblical moment where like someone's going to come and save you and Moses is going to part the Red Sea of your life. Like mastery is in the mundane. Mm -hmm. It's in the little things. It's in the day-to-day. -day. And if we could start to make those subtle adjustments, they create new trends and new trajectories. And the next thing you know, one year, three years, five years, wow, I started all the way back there. And look at where I'm at now, just consciously making subtle adjustments day after day consistently. Push, push, by, push by push. Yeah, absolutely. What a powerful story about your dad, man. Um, I can't imagine, going, you know, that's got to be super challenging going through that for eight years, but... What a, a beautiful lesson he left you with. That's yeah, super inspiring. powerful. It really mm. is inspiring. Inspiring to me. Mm. Um, I think, you know, hitting on, you know, mastering the mundane. Why do you think that's so hard for, I think I was going to say, uh, you know, an up and coming generation or, you know, I don't want to give them a bad rep. I think most people actually study with the, the, the mastering or putting their head down and going to work on the mundane, why do you think it's so challenging? I think because we're conditioned to want peak yeah. experiences, yeah. which is immediate, it's now, yeah. it's big, it's grandiose. But the, here's the way I look at it. Like if we're fortunate enough to live to 90, 100, like mm -hmm. we take care of ourselves, mm -hmm. we're conscious of, let's say, let's say we make 90. Mm -hmm. Even if we're fortunate enough to make 90, how many peak experiences are you really going to have in life? How many kids are you going to have? Mm -hmm. How many titles are you going to win? How many, like how many are you really going to have? If you have a thousand, I think that's generous. So what that means is if I live to 90 and I have a thousand peak experiences in my life, 
which I think I'm being generous about, that means that the majority of life is in the mundane. So if I'm constantly conditioning myself that a good life is only as many peak experiences as I could get as close together as possible, I'm actually setting myself up for depression and failure because mm -hmm. it's going to skyrocket up and then it's going to skyrocket down. And so what happens is I think a lot of us, we look at the mundane as uh, we want to escape the mundane. Avoid it. We want to avoid oh, it. Oh, yeah. Everyone escape wants to it. avoid it. And I just want give me peak experiences as many as I can. Mm -hmm. I think we're conditioned to want that with dopamine and mm -hmm. things like that. But once you start to look at rather than escape the mundane with peak experiences, you start to master the mundane and then peak experiences become an enhancement of the mundane. That's when life mm -hmm. radically changes. Mm -hmm. When you look at your peak experiences, like my marriage is great. And then when we take that trip to Italy or whatever, like it only enhances it. That's when life is really firing, mm -hmm. where you're not looking at the mundane as like, how do I get out of this? Mm -hmm. How do I live for the weekend or live for the two week break that mm -hmm. I get? That's, tr that's a major compromise and trade off. So I think the mundane, and, and this is the way I say it, like mastery is in the mundane and mastery isn't sexy, but the results of mastery are. And that's a key. Like everyone wants the results oh, yeah. of commitment oh, and consistency yeah. and discipline, yeah. but it's not sexy. When you break so it down, it's not life changing. It's just so simple. True. And it's, it's just based on consistency and commitment. Mm -hmm. it, it's so interesting you say that. Um, you know, I can't even tell you that there's been so many times in my life where I've been told a version of, you get rewarded, you know, in public for what you do in private. Like, no one sees it. Yep. No one sees it. And everyone, you know, wants, you know, I, I've said this story to so many team members, but... I was living like this life, like you want to arrive and be in a certain position. But if I put you in that position right now, you probably, you, 99% of the people would not be able to handle it because what you go through in the journey to arrive at that position is exactly the equipment that you need to sustain the position. No doubt about it. And it's like, it's like, I, we, I've heard this before, the lottery winners. You you heard the TV, you saw the TV show. What's the story about? What's the TV show about the lottery winners? It's like eighty percent. Yeah, eighty percent of them they get. Work. Yeah, <clears throat> fifty million, a hundred million dollars. They're all. This show highlights how fast they go to bankruptcy because yep. they didn't work to get there, so they don't have the tools to sustain that life. Exactly. It's crazy because you you cannot put prosperity on a broke mindset. It'll never work. Another way that I, wow. I, I coach that, wow. yeah, it, it won't work. It, the way I coach that is a very simple, most of all my coaching is based on this simple principle. Context generates content. Mm -hmm. Meaning that a person's context, a person's inner world and or inner environment generates what shows up in it. Mm -hmm. So a cactus grows in the desert. Context, desert, cactus, content, results, what shows up. Most humans live in the North Pole and they really want a cactus. I'm like, oh, plant 10, plant 100, plant one in August, plant one in December. It's never going to grow. Mm -hmm. It's never going to grow because the, the environment doesn't lend to it. So if you want a cactus, you've got to cultivate the environment desert. Wow. That's the only wow. way to have it happen. So if you want the content or the result of prosperity... You've got to cultivate a prosperous mindset. Mm -hmm. You've got to cultivate prosperous behaviors, prosperous disciplines, and pro prosperous habits. There's no way it's going to work any other way. Mm -hmm. If you want a thriving relationship, you've got to create the environment where a thriving relationship is possible and sustainable through communication, through consideration, through attraction, through aim, through all these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like you're saying, we are so over-focused on the content that we miss, ah, oh, I've actually, the, the most of the yeah. focus needs to be on the context, my, yeah. my environment, my inner world. It's incredible. I, said, dude, I can't tell you how many younger people that I've either mentored, I've been fortunate to work with, where they're like, I believe I should have this position. And it's not, I, 
I get off on saying what I see in this person is greatness in their ability. Like they're going to like rule the world. I can just see it. They have those great tools inside them. But right now, you need all those experiences. And quite simply, if I'm if you know someone confronts me with Mark, I should be in this position. I said, Why do you think you're not there right now? Yeah. Yep. Like that that's really it. Yeah. You're not there right now for a reason. Now someone else is probably gonna put you in that position, but what you you don't know what you don't know. Right. And and then the, you're going to be plopped and dropped in an area where you've just created your ceiling because you don't have the experience. Yep. And you need to have that experience. All the stuff that we avoid that we don't want to do. And I, <laughs> listen, I got a whole resume full of stuff I, I tried to avoid. And the second I started saying, I'm here for a reason. Yeah. I need to get good at this. And I need to marry the idea of going all into these mundane tasks. Totally. You know? There, there's, you know, my clients are always joking. They're like, when are we going to create the bumper sticker business? Because they all know all of my themes that mm-hmm. I coach by. Mm-hmm. And one of the ones is, you're, you're nailing it is results aren't random. They're not. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why we didn't choose you. There's a reason why you're not in that. Like, and now if you can look at it, not with judgment, but with actual like honest awareness and discernment mm-hmm. and say like, wait, there's a reason he didn't choose me for that position. Mm-hmm. Now I could, I could inner reflect. I could say like, what skill do I need to learn or acquire or hire? What do I need to organize? Mm-hmm. What, what skill set do I need to adapt? What do I need to right. start doing or stop doing? I could look at my results mm-hmm. and a lot of people like, that's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. But here's the thing: when it comes to responsibility and accountability, like your bank account is the way that it is because of me. My my marriage is the way that it is because of me. Mm-hmm. My health is the way that it is because of me. Like my results don't lie; they just reveal what I'm really committed to. Mm-hmm. So they're not random. Mm-hmm. And once we could actually start to look at our results from that neutral discernment rather than judgment, which is like, what's up with you, Mark? Like you don't know how to run this ship. Or even beat myself up over and say, like, oh, I'll never get there. How can I actually pause and say, with honest assessment, honest discernment, and say, okay, this is where I'm at. So in order to get to the next plateau, what do I need to learn? What do I need to acquire? What do I need to start doing? What do I need to stop doing? Or where do I need to turn the dial up Mm -hmm. or turn the dial down? Now I can actually look at that with neutrality and say, all right, this is where I'm at. This is the season of my life. Mm -hmm. I want to get to this next season. What's it going to require? What's it going to require of me, though? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where, that's but that's where that liberation is. Oh yeah, it, it's interesting what you said. I would have thought, you know, once you said, "Hey, why didn't I get that position or that role? Call it whatever you want." You get to look inside yourself and figure out why. Yep. However, what about the the mindset? People who have the mindset that say, you know. I refuse to believe, right? We're yeah. going down this road. I yeah. refuse to believe that I lack the tools, the awareness, the intellect, the EQ. Yeah. Call it whatever you want and don't want to focus on their stuff. I was thinking about this for the last two days when I knew we were going to chat. How many people figure out or acquire the tools to say, you know what? I need to take a good look at myself yeah. and I'm going to hold myself accountable and I'm going to start working on me because there's something in what this person just told me. And I'm talking aside from the social media, yeah. don't care what anyone else says and you got to do you. We're not talking about that. If you're not where you are, where you want to be, how many people can learn how to look inside themselves and say, look, there's a reason for that. Yeah. It's not politics. Right. And that's kind of what you do, I think. Right? Yeah. Well, here's the thing is like, it's within all of our potential mm-hmm. as human beings. Now, the amount or percentage of people that choose it, I'm hope you know, I'm hopeful that it's growing. <laughs> Put it that way. But it that's free will. Mm-hmm. You have the choice. And here's the thing. You have the choice to be a victim for the rest of your life. It's actually your choice as a human being. My job is just to remind people that your choices are what generate your experiences. So if you choose, to, if you choose <laughs> to be, powerful. yeah, maybe they're, they're connected. If you choose that route, God bless you. Just know that with that choice, these are the experiences that come with it. 
blame, shame, guilt, resentment. Like, have at it. That's your free will as a human being. Now, if you choose accountability and responsibility, which is also your choice as a human being, the experiences that come with that are inspiration, contribution, growth, growth mindedness, team, community. Mm-hmm. I'm not here, and I, I, this may sound strange, but I'm not here to tell anyone how to live. I'm just here to remind people they have the choice in the experience of how they live. And when you start to really take the courage, which I think it does require to look within and be inward, to have courage and say like, hold on, what am I choosing through my mindset, in my context, in my habits and my behaviors and my filters that I'm you know, interacting with myself, others in the world? Well, when I, have, when I actually reclaim that choice, I could generate a whole new experience. I'm just here to remind people you still have a choice. It's interesting, and I think that it sounds like a lot of people do need a reminder. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. I am, you know, the master of my fate. Yeah. You know, in the, and they have it. If you, when you reframe it, Mike, you start to think, wait a minute, this is volunteer only. I, I volunteered for this yeah. and I asked for this. Yep. Like you, and, and then the next conversation is how you view things. And I always give this example, you know, the meme on Instagram where there's two people on the bus going around the mountain and one of them is facing the mountain. Oh, yeah. And the yeah. other one's facing the light and smiling. All you have to do is sit on the other side. That's it. You know, so That's it's it. a choice. It's a choice. You know, and it's a I, choice. You know, aside from, you know, mental health issues and things like that it still is a choice and I think that you showing people there's a way to reframe it yeah and just alter your perspective if you focus on certain things well there's I, th- I think it's Tony Robbins that has this um, equation like this happiness equation and I, and I think your blueprint we're happiest when our blueprint matches our life conditions and so my blueprints, my inner world, and my life conditions are my external world. Now, what, where we always get, get to remember is that if I can't change my life conditions, I can always change my blueprint. And once I've established my blueprint, now I could go and change my life conditions to match it. Mm-hmm. And one of the best examples I could think of is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Could not change his life conditions. So what could he change? His blueprint about it. Mm-hmm. So if you think of the worst possible human experience this is what he chose couldn't change his life conditions but this is what he chose he chose to change his blueprint about it perspective about it emotions about it filters about it context about it so if your life conditions aren't matching up to your blueprint Mm -hmm. we'll suffer and remember that you could choose to change one or the other and if you can't change your life conditions you change a blueprint about Mm -hmm. it perspective like you're saying like face the other way get in the other seat Mm -hmm. and then that's when our life is most fluid and on fire is that when I have chosen my blueprint and I'm either generating those life conditions or at least trending toward them Mm -hmm. because we don't have to have it all right away we're even fulfilled and happy when we're even trending toward that trending toward that alignment with our own inner world and blueprint and I've always thought, Mike, that that's where people are most happy when they're actually working towards something. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's so healthy. At every point in my life, any, uh, I'd say, major uh, period of my life or intersection, I always had these huge goals. And I was thinking about this today. Those goals were so ridiculously insane, but... I've knocked out all those goals because I was actually working towards yeah. them, mm-hmm. and I and I wrote every literally wrote each one down, but I felt fulfilled in the process of working towards them. But that, that's the cliche. Like mm-hmm. it's the journey. It's mm-hmm. the journey that shapes us into who we are. It's the journey that builds the character. Mm-hmm. Like we associate the the peak experience of like this is what it means to have respect or admiration mm-hmm. but it's the journey that mm-hmm. shapes the character along the way that's right. why your example before of you take someone from the from the valley and just put them on the summit they, they missed the entire journey along the way like that's where the strength is built that's where the that's where the 
the iron is fortified, so to mm-hmm. speak. Mm-hmm. So, you know, those, you, you know, what you're saying here of, of like that journey that shaped you, like we, we, it, core in us, we want to have a function to fill. Mm-hmm. Right, like I, we, how many times have we heard CEOs like sell their companies and then they, well they party for like two months and they're like I, I can't do it. Right, right, right. I, they have to get back in. I got to get back into something. It. That's that's how I, that's who they are. The, you, I I can't I can't mm-hmm. just sit here and not do anything. And there's a there's an element of fulfillment that it solidifies through service contribution or advancing something forward, whether it's something in society or something. It's got, but we, we get lost without a function to fill. Mm-hmm. And, I, and if, if you want, a lot of people, I think one of the challenges is a lot of people want like a, a life without problems or a life without challenges. But if someone has no challenges, I'm like, you just don't have enough responsibility. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I, I you don't, your goals aren't big enough. I, you know, two things you said there, Mike. The, the first one was the wealthy people that I've dealt with you know, I always used to think when I was younger, oh my goodness, this person has so much money. Why don't they just go off and live on an island? And then I realized every single one of those very, uh, very successful people or billionaires, they're in it. Yeah. Like, and then it hit yep. me maybe 10 years ago. It's really not about the money. Maybe it is to pound their chest every right. once in a while, but they live for the build. Yeah. They live to struggle and work it out in in deals and closes and contracts they mm-hmm. live for it and you can see it like they're they're alive when they're right. talking about it yeah and it, it's not even a possibility for them to stop because <laughs> right. they'll die right they'll die they'll at least die inside and you know um the 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 other thing i noticed when you were talking about building in in, in the process I, i've seen so many young people that they don't understand you have to absolutely love what it is. And I heard this recently. I was talking to a young lady and she said, I was dealing with a very challenging uh, leadership group at this former place I was working at. And I said, how did you deal with that? And she said, I focused on my mission Mm -hmm. and I focused on what I was, what I was there for. Yeah. And she reframed it. You know, and, and I was so blown away by that. And she said, it just and everything always worked out. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the, the way I frame that, like, I love what you're saying is you do fall in love with the mission, fall in love with the journey, fall in love with the process. Because if you don't, you're going to get side railed mm-hmm. at challenges. And uh, one of the ways that I, I frame and coach that is average people run their lives based on circumstances and conditions Mm -hmm. exceptional people run their lives based on commitments say that again please (laughs) (laughs) everyone listen up grab a pen (laughs) average people run their lives based on circumstances and conditions exceptional people run their lives based on commitments that will separate you great from average every day all day all day every day because if my life is run by circumstances and conditions, the first or second challenge I hit, see ya, and then there's no more mastery. But if I'm committed, I'm gonna see through the challenge, I'm gonna see through the roadblock, I'm gonna get creative, I'm gonna get yes. inspired, I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna acquire that skill that I need mm-hmm. at, to get to that next plateau. That's why commitment is so generative. Mm-hmm. Without commitment, all is lost. A million percent, and that's the skill if someone comes to me and they say, Mark, you know, I, I really, my heart's really not in this. I always say, look, my, my job is not to convince you that it yeah, is. Totally. I'm not here for that. Yeah. But I will caution you to one thing. Are you sure that your heart's not in it or you're struggling because it's challenging? Right. You're struggling with the commitment because right. yeah. you're just going to take that to the next thing you do and then to the next thing totally. you do. And when I was at Lucas' uh, event, mm-hmm. I said, I don't think people understand that. I give an example at anatomy. You're not picking up weights and you're not being professional and you're not emailing people and texting people and trying to keep some sort of system and structure for us. Of course it helps us that you're professional. And we need awesome, we have an incredible team here. However, 
this is for you. Yeah. This is for your development because you could take those skill sets and those commitments anywhere. Right. It's about you. Right. And they're like, ah. <laughs> I'm like, exactly. You see, this is our generation yeah. that grew up with Mr. Miyagi, oh, right? Oh, like, yeah. you, you're just, Love you're it. just, you're sanding the floor, you're mm -hmm. painting the fence. Like, mm -hmm. th but that's mastery. The little stuff adds up. And when people start to flip that and say, like, oh, the way I do one thing can show me the way I do everything if I'm willing to look at it that way. Oh, all this, now I'm not just putting weights on a barbell. Now I'm not just, you know, connecting with the community that's here. Now, mm -hmm. now it, it, it takes a whole different meaning. Mm -hmm. And that is so, so key. Because here's, you know, it's almost like crab bucket mentality. Oh, yeah. You cannot, I don't care how enlightened you are how skillful you are how much work you've done you'll never bring someone up that's unwilling but Not another powerful one <laughs> you, you can't yeah. you just you no amount of effort or you know retreats or whatever you do. Sure. Like, if yeah. someone if someone's unwilling then that's the that's the that's the nail in the coffin mm -hmm. if you're in a relationship and you want to grow and someone's unwilling it, it that's it. Mm -hmm. it the, the soil dries up mm -hmm. if they're willing then people are like patient and you don't need to be at the same pace as I do you don't need to be on the same page all the time like right. as long as we're willing to grow that's that's what people actually uh, innately start to understand about each other and, and get their mm -hmm. vibe and get their commitment but if you have if you don't have that or if you don't choose that I should say mm -hmm then you're limited and mm -hmm. what ends up happening like you gave a great example of it i call it you know when, when i'm coaching someone they're like listen i, I want to make a move in my life or, or break free from this you know this corporate trap that i'm in my one thing that i always say is let's make sure we're not trading masters that we're not making oh, yeah. lateral moves. Yeah, we're leaving one prison to go to another one. Don't don't say here like, ah, oh, once I have a new boss, then everything's going to be okay. Once I have a better commute, then everything's going to be I'm like, yeah. hold on. Are we making lateral moves here and just trading masters? Mm -hmm. Or are we actually doing something that's genuine and authentic to your commitment mm -hmm. that lines up to it? Which is going to require courage and creativity oh, yeah. and... The willingness to mess up and the willingness to see things mm -hmm. another way. Like mm -hmm. we're not trading masters here; we're advancing, and they're not the same thing. It's so interesting. Uh, so I'll tell you a story right along the lines of what you just shared with our with our listeners. When I was uh, a free agent uh, in the NFL, I, my family, I had my mother and my brother who were in my life. They were, they were incredible, but. My, I spent a lot of time, the man that was most influential in my life, and I, the whole team knows him, and I'm going to bring him in sometime, because they never met him. I, his name is Jim Reed. He was the head football coach where I played college football. And he was just, an, I mean, the guy was like 5'8", but he walked like he was 7 feet tall, charisma, energy. He was like a more serious uh, Ted Lasso. Right? I mean, he was... Great visual. It's unbelievable. Great visual, right? like, and this guy was like... I want, I want, honestly, there's a lot of things I do today. I'm like, man, I stole that right from Coach Reed. You know? <laughs> just because who he was. Like, he was the most positive, uplifting, want to see you do well person. And I'm like, man, I need to be more like Coach Reed. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. So when I was a free agent in the NFL, he gave me an opportunity to coach college football. So I had one season, uh, defensive line coach, and... Uh, I was in the off season. I recruited, going to high schools. Oof. Wow, it was wild, right? Wow. So, you know, after the recruiting, I said, "Coach, you know, um, I don't know if I want to be a coach." And he was like, well, "Why? You're going to be an amazing coach." And I said, um, "Because, you know, I, I I I see you guys, and you basically responsible for raising me, and but I see your lives, and it scares me that I, mm -hmm. you guys never see your families and." And he goes, well, I understand that. He didn't talk me out of it. He said, I understand that. He said, just be careful, Mark, because the way you're wired, no matter where you are in this world, you're going to do things the same way. Yeah. Mm. So I was like, I don't really understand that. <laughs> and then I became a trainer. So when I was coaching college football, I was up at 4 a.m. And, you know, we're doing our stuff. We're setting up. We're you're watching video. And then I became a trainer. I'm getting up at 4 a.m. <laughs> and it's long days and you don't see your family. And then yeah. starting business, it's like 
It's the exact same thing. It doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. My brother's a construction worker in Massachusetts. We both get up at 3.45 a.m. <laughs> we both test each other in the morning. He's a construction worker. I'm a trainer. So as you said, trading masters. Yeah. Right? yeah. So it's super interesting. So let's talk about your group. So you decided to start these groups. We'll talk about the groups first and get into the book if you're okay with that. Tell us about the group. How did that start? Well, I, you know, I, I run... Um, the group actually started... I, I run a retreat out in Montana... My father's final wish. Got to get in the group together. Right? <laughs> so this is actually, this, this is uh, the genesis of it all. My father's final wish, my father was a big outdoorsman. His final wish was to have his ashes put on a glacier in Montana. That's beautiful. And I, I made a promise to him. I said, all right, I'll, that's your final wish. And I'll come back every summer and uh, spend time with you. So I've kept that promise for six years. And I had a coach at the time. I had a coach, a mentor at the time. And my mentor was like, you know, this is, this is amazing. You take this personal pilgrimage every summer to be with your father. And you coach men. And I was like, yeah, what's your point? <laughs> it was like so obvious of a, of a solution or, of, a, or of, an, of an endeavor. Like it was so obvious it was under my nose. And my mentor, my coach was like, have you ever thought about leading men's retreats? to this like really sacred place and i was like all right this summer i'll do the first one and that was five years ago and it sells out before it even goes public wow. it, it just it's that something great. that uh, th these men just crave mm -hmm. they i think they crave the camaraderie and the brotherhood in this like ma amazing magical mm -hmm. place where they feel like little kids again like mm -hmm. it's that it's that amazing and i remember being on one of these retreats that i was leading and i was like how are all these amazing men just meeting now? Some I coached personally, some I you know, used to coach, or they were in some circle of mine of, of, of work. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized, I was like, they've never met because there's no environment for them to meet. Mm -hmm. There's no you know, facility for growth-minded men to gather. Right, right. So when I came home from one of the trips, I was like, all right, I'm gonna start leading online men's programs so that these men from all over the world could actually connect. I've had some of these where they go all the way from Australia to Mexico. Wow. And it was a place for growth-minded men to actually connect. And, and because one of the things that I noticed was lacking for men to really expedite their progress was community and brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were like, listen, I keep trying to do all this on my own. So I took some of my own personal experience and some of the most impactful coaching mm -hmm. that I've received or that I've come up with and I put it in a 12-week program and these I take eight men at a time and they go through this 12-week program and the four pillars are very simple awareness plus action plus accountability equals advancement like we've got to become aware you're not going to you're not going to change or transform anything you're unaware of mm -hmm. so you, we've got to become aware of the, our inner world of our context our mindset our behaviors mm -hmm. and what's uh, underneath that's actually generating it mm -hmm. what are the lies we're telling ourselves what are the fallacies we're living under what are the assumptions the narratives that are running us that generate behavior mm -hmm. so the first part of the of the program is about that then Awareness. And are they sharing? Yes. They're sharing. Yeah, it's all communal. Ooh, it's got to be. It's got. It's got to be a tough night by the fire. No? It's. It's. It's impactful. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and and you know, we're sharing this out of honesty and out of discernment. We're not judging ourselves yeah. or judging each other. It's what are you noticing? What are you becoming aware of? Now, awareness is great, but awareness and four dollars will get you a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. like, now that I see it, now what? What am I going to do about it? Mm -hmm. So what really gets us into the end zone is awareness plus a new committed action. Mm -hmm. So now that I see it, what's the action I'm going to take? What's the action I'm going to, like we were saying before, start, stop, dial up, dial down. Mm -hmm. And all of that is expedited with accountability. Mm -hmm. You will grow far faster in a group of people that you respect or admire than you ever will on your own. We're communal by nature. Mm -hmm. So awareness plus accountability, excuse me, awareness plus action plus accountability, that's what equals advancement. We were just talking about trading masters. Right. So I always distinguish movement from advancement. Okay. Many people are moving. I don't think people are not successful due to lack of effort. I think people aren't successful due to lack of accuracy. 
Mm. And the moment you actually see like, wait, I'm spending all this energy, I'm moving. Ener mo movement is just energy in motion. Advancement is energy in motion in a deliberate direction. So I've got to have a clear vision. I've got to have clear mission, clear goals, clear protocols. That's what makes me accurate. That's what makes it, having that priority that I'm, I'm redesigning and, re and committing and reshaping my life toward. Mm -hmm. That's what makes us accurate. So rocking chairs move, they don't go anywhere. True. I think a lot of people are spending so much energy on so much like movement and oh, yeah. let me try this and let me try this and let me try this. I, I'm more interested in my clients being accurate than just simply let me just go move. Mm -hmm. And if you put those three things together, aware, self-awareness, action, committed action, and accountability, then you naturally will generate advancement in results. Amazing. It sounds like an incredible retreat, by the way. It, it's got to be. I'd imagine like you have eight men sitting there. It's eight plus you, correct? So, so that's the retreat. Okay. And then the, the online course is called Find Your Tribe. Mm -hmm. That's the 12-week course. Okay. That's the that's find your tribe. That's where the the retreat inspired me to come home and say, you know, these guys are doing this. It's once a year. They're out in Montana. It's great, mm -hmm. but we need something that's more sustainable. That's actually going to be in their lives with them for longer. That's when I came home from the retreat and developed the twelve week course. That's where I take the, okay. the eight guys online for twelve uh, weeks. Okay, so they, they come eight guys come off the retreat and they go to the online program for eight. No, you could do one or the other. Okay, but a lot of the times they they blend and okay, they, yeah. So a lot of guys that oh, have done cool. find your tribe end up coming to the retreat in Montana. And a lot of guys who do the retreat in Montana end up joining find your tribe. And you do you do this? How many groups like this do you do a year? Typically six. Six. Six a year. Oh, that's yeah. very cool. Yeah, six a year. That's great. Yeah. So I'm just imagining like I can, I can see like. You know, men in general, I think, you know, you've seen the movie uh, The Mask We Live In. No. Uh, no. I've no. Seen it. no. Oh, goodness gracious. This, right. this might end up being mandatory uh, <laughs> uh, documentary for your group. I don't know. But you, it's called The Mask We Live In or They Live In. It's about what men should be, what mm. we're taught at a young age, which yeah. really handcuffs us and is, yeah. creates a lot of chaos, pressure, and anxiety for, for men you can't be uh, sensitive. You yeah. can't be. You can't be emotional. You can't care about other people. You can't, you know, be too friendly. You got to be a hard ass. And yeah. it's like, dude, like, you got to scrap that, or it's going to eat you alive. You know, no doubt about it. You're also, if you think of, if you think of the the cultural narrative mm -hmm. uh, for men or masculinity, mm -hmm. just what you said, don't be emotional, or uh, you know, turn off the, that part of you. Belichick. It's <laughs> You're turning off, that means you're turning off half of your skill set, half of your gifts, and half of your potential. And when you do that, then the best life becomes is like a mental chess match. Which Manipulation. It's a, a total Ugh. breed uh, of anxiety and depression and pressure and manipulation. It's, it's, I mean, it's terrible. And it's, so, oh. so many men, that, especially that I coach, or that come into these groups that are like, They've been so mentally uh, grinding themselves down and trying to figure out solutions logically that I'm like, wait, have you ever thought of like recruiting your heart into this decision or into the way you're living or into so foreign like, to them, bro? It's like, oh, there's, oh, I know there, there, there's, oh, no, no, there's, there's concrete right <laughs> above it. I'm like, Wow, well, well, that's where all your potential is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a great Native American saying that says, the longest journey a man will ever make is only 14 inches from his head to his heart. It's the wow. longest journey we'll ever wow. make. Got a few gems here, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, so it, it, it's so interesting when you start to, even like the communication skills, it's like, did you... How do you feel? I feel terrible. Uh, how, why do you feel terrible? Because of this person. Did you talk to him? Why would I do that? Well, it's like, yeah. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> they would make you feel better. Maybe you could work it out. Maybe you wouldn't feel that bad. It's such a foreign concept or idea. It's like, I literally, I've heard a man say, um, I don't have that gear. Yeah. I'm like, oh, do you care to develop it? <laughs> I mean, do you like just try? You know, it's, I mean, everything else in life. And it's so interesting going back to what you said at the beginning. It's like, you have to practice certain things and you have to build those certain behaviors at, 
because I come from an athletic background, I didn't realize that I put so much effort into sports, into football, into my skill set, into being the very best that I could, which was very average. But the point is, I didn't realize that the way I approach sport to be better mm. is exactly the way I need to approach my relationships yeah. and my, my marriage and all those things. And I, the second I did that, everything was better. Everything. And it's like, no, 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 sports because I'm, I'm hardcore and I'm driven, but why aren't you hardcore with your marriage? Right. Like, <laughs> you know. And it, but that, I, I think that's a huge thing because I think one of the cultural narratives for men is be one-dimensional, which is just go be successful. And the lie we're sold is once you're successful, that fixes everything else. And I'm like... Uh, what? I, I, I can show you lots I, of test I, cases. <laughs> I've had men come to me and be like, and I'm not kidding. Uh, they will, they'll come to me and be like, my marriage is really suffering. And I'll say, okay, well, what are you doing about it? I've been working a lot harder. I'm like, working harder? That, those are two radically different things. As a matter of fact, you working so much is probably one of the reasons your marriage is suffering. But we're so conditioned to be one-dimensional that because we're sold a lie that once you're successful that cup overflows and fixes everything else it'll fix your relationship it right. fixes everything a lie is understated by the way uh, I mean. radically <laughs> understated so a lot of where i invite men into is to move from one dimensional to dynamic and dynamic is the man whose all of your commitments are happening in excellence so if you think of what i call a domain in life a domain in life is anything that requires and deserves love and attention. So your career, your marriage, your health, your finances, your spiritual life, your friendships, mm -hmm. they all require love and attention. They deserve love and attention. And if you don't give it to them, they, they suffer. Mm -hmm. So a dynamic man, exactly what you're saying is I can run my business and, and earn what I want to earn and still turn that off, come home, be present with my wife or with my children. I can nurture my relationships and friendships and carve out that time so they, they know they're important. I handle my health. I handle my finances. I keep track of my investments. Like, oh, that's a whole different man. Mm -hmm. But that's where in, I distinguish you know, I was talking one dimension and dynamic, it's also success and fulfillment. So success is an accomplishment in a particular domain of life. Usually for men, it's usually career. But fulfillment is when all the domains of my life receive the appropriate amount of love and attention. Okay. That's when we're most fulfilled. When my health is on fire, mm -hmm. my marriage is on fire, my finances are on mm -hmm. fire, my friendships are on fire, my spiritual life is on fire. That requires a whole different participation of mm -hmm. a man. Head, heart, habit, behavior, the willingness to do the work. But that's mm -hmm. a dynamic man. And that's mm -hmm. the man that I'm really interested in evolving into, coaching into, and, and being a catalyst for. Because I think the way that we've been taught of one dimensionality is just crushing the spirit of a man. Oh, I think it crushes human beings. Period. Um, in the, as you were leading into that, I was thinking, uh, you know, you were taught to be successful. And I always say, what's your definition of success? Yeah. Like, you're, you're telling me you're successful. You know, the, during COVID, they had that thing. And, um, you know, it said, watch, uh, a, a, a man takes his son out of the house who was in um, uh, quarantine. And he said, um, you know, son, this is very hard on the world. And this is not political. He says this is very hard in the world, and it, it was being in quarantine. It's not hard. It's hard for everyone, right? And then he takes his uh, son out for a walk in the city, uh, not the city, it's like the countryside. But there's a lot of homes there. And he says, "What do you see, son?" He says, "Dad, I I see people walking. I see dogs. I see animals. I see friends. I see people playing outside. I see people enjoying outside, moving, having fun." I said, I think this is the best environment we've ever been in. So the father looks at it as like a detriment. The kid looks at it like a gift. It's <laughs> yeah. like, what's your definition of totally. coming full circle? Totally. That's how you view things, you know? Totally. And I've seen men who are worth millions or billions of dollars and 
I wouldn't trade with them in a second. Right. I really wouldn't, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I, I, I wouldn't want to be that person for a second. And I mean that in the most respectful way. And I have lots of respect for them. Yeah. It's just, you know, what is your definition of success? Totally. You know, you know if, if we were to go, you know, into the, the weight room here with all the equipment, someone mm-hmm. would walk in and say, like, well, what should I use? I don't know. It depends on your goal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> depends on what, what's success for you. It all works. It's all good. <laughs> I hate to say that's my favorite answer. It depends. It depends. You know, and depends. no one, people don't like that. I'm like, I don't know what your intention is. What's your intention? Depends what you want. Depends what success is. Mm-hmm. Depends what your goal is. Mm-hmm. Well, once, because that's, that's the thing. Our vision is what gives our actions meaning. So, for instance, if I were to say to you, Mark, I want to go for a ride. I want to go for a drive. Like, any, we, there's a thousand roads right here in Miami. Like, take any one of them. But the moment I say to you, Mark, I want to go for a drive and I want to get to Denver, Colorado, mm-hmm. all of a sudden now the road I choose matters. The vision is what gives the road I'm on meaning. I'm now on a right road, a wrong road, an effective road, or an ineffective road. Mm-hmm. The moment I establish that vision, the moment I establish that mission or goal, it now becomes that mirror that we were talking about before of like, I can now take an honest reflection mm-hmm. and say, well, what are the thoughts, habits, actions, mindset, behaviors that are leading me closer to that mm-hmm. or further away from it or I'm just actually staying standstill? Mm-hmm. So the moment we establish, well, what's the definition of success for you? What's the vision? What's the thing that you've determined is worth striving for? That's Our worth. That's the. That's yeah. it. That's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, my definition of goal. Mm-hmm. Something I've determined is worth striving for, mm-hmm. which means now there's an inventory that I have to take. Now, are the th- are the behaviors that I'm doing leading up to that? Mm-hmm. Are the thoughts I'm thinking, the narratives that I'm running, do they lead me closer to that or further away? Mm-hmm. Now I get to take an honest inventory, but sometimes we're so afraid to set the vision because we're afraid of failure, we're afraid oh, how yeah. much effort it'll take. But once you determine personally for yourself, this is what I've determined is worth striving for. Now you'll be able to redesign who you are, let go of certain things, add certain things, scramble yourself up, go through the fire, keep working through the challenges, get creative through the roadblocks, and then let the journey shape you because you've determined that's worth striving for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when we're clear on that, it now gives new meaning to what we do or to what we're not doing. Oh, absolutely. So well said. Okay. So, man, I feel like I got a coaching session. <laughs> so I, I, I certainly owe you. Tell us about what, the book. Uh, Mike's book is uh, New Man Emerging. New Man Emerging. An Awakening man's guide to living a life of purpose passion freedom and fulfillment first of all we talked off air about what it's like to write a book talk to us about that oh. that's a good time yeah. <laughs> it is a good time it's a challenging time but it's good to good to look back on mm-hmm. uh you know what's interesting is i uh i i woke my wife and i were in bed and i sleep like a rock I mean, I, I sleep like a teenager with mono. We suffer from the same affliction. <laughs> <Right>. so, <laughs> so like three o'clock in the morning one night, I wake up and I, these, these words are just coming to me. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about my father and my father's an influence in this book. And I was thinking about my father and I couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I, went in, I got out of bed, went into my office, started typing, went back, went to sleep. And it happened three nights in a row. And my wife was like, what are you doing in the middle of the night? So I had read her what I had wrote, which is the dedication in the book, in the intro. And, my, and I didn't know what it was at the time. My, my wife was like, you need to write a book. And I was like, uh, yeah, I'm good. Mm-hmm. So later that night, we're at my mother's house an hour north of here. And my, my wife was like, read your mother what you read me this morning. And I read it. And my mother was like, you need to write a book. And I was like, well, here's the two most influential women in my oh, yeah. life oh, yeah. telling me I need to do something. Like, mm. So I sat with a, a minute and I said to my mom and to my uh, wife, I said, all right, I'm going to do it. And I thought at the time, like, I don't mind waking up in the middle of the night. I'll just write whatever comes and something will happen. 
And the moment I said I committed to my mom and to my wife that I'd write the book, it all dried up. Blank. Blank. Always. Always. So I was like, wait, I thought this like big inspirational biblical <laughs> pull. I got this and I'm writing and like Russell Crowe in Beautiful Mind. I told you I'll build a shed yeah. outside. I'll just like, make Stephen these King, equations yeah. and all right. So it all just dried up and I was like, wait a second. This is going to require like major consistent commitment and discipline. So what I started to do was I was my coach at the time had written 31 books and I had said I have this idea and I made this commitment mm -hmm. and he said great what when are you going to be done and for some reason I threw out an arbitrary date of October 1st and he said great rule number one of writing a book make a deadline rule number two of writing a book keep the deadline Oof. and I was like oh god wait I just said October let me yeah, say yeah. and he's like no nope, you said October Ooh. he said but I'll make you a deal if you finish the book by the deadline which by the way was like four months from that day oh my god I don't want to talk about <laughs> what I told Mike off air about how long it took me <laughs> god. It there was, was a four involved but it was a month go ahead <laughs> <laughs> so he, I think it was four or six months and he said but I'll make you a deal if you keep the deadline send it to me and I'll read it if I think it's worth publishing I'll give it to my publisher and editor wow and my wife is I'm on speaker and my wife is like what is going on right now are you kidding me how is this happening and I was like wow I just made this commitment how am I going to see this through and what I very similar to what we've been talking about I said you know what I'm going to break this down into the mundane what does it look like mm -hmm. and what all I did was I said this portion of time every day is writing time no phone, no distractions, no coaching, no nothing. Every day, this is going to happen. How long was that time just out of curiosity? Uh, an hour. Every day hour, for at least an hour. That's amazing. I, most people, anyone who wrote a book will understand this, but for me, it took an hour just to warm up. Really? <laughs> I get it. Yeah. I get it. That's it amazing that you could get it down in an hour. Think about it. Like There's days, I'm sure you remember, there's days you sit for an hour and you're just staring at the screen. Oh, I sat all afternoon on a Sunday. <laughs> and I, and it, was, it was really bad. And I'm like, this is, this is dangerous. It's you know? rough. It was really rough. It was rough. But I had this deadline. I made this commitment. And I wanted it to be 50,000 words. It ended up being 60,000. But wow. I remember the first half of it was all discipline it was really just sitting down every day and staying committed when was and the last time you did that it, sit down don't look at your phone my god don't talk it was a slog Oof. but then i noticed i looked down at the, at the screen and i was at twenty five thousand words and wow. i was like wait there's something here mm -hmm. and then the first twenty five thousand words were a slog and the the second half was just flow. a flow. Wow. But at first, it was the discipline, the consistency, and the commitment that got me to it. That was just Interesting. moving. Yeah. Interesting. Exactly <laughs> what we're talking about. Yeah. And from that discipline, all of a sudden, that that muscle just got trained. That muscle got exercised and, and stronger so that in the second half, when I sat down, I was like, let's go. The first half was a slog. Mm. The second half... That muscle just got built. Mm -hmm. Everything we're talking about here is is crazy. A, a microcosm of of the book process. Just in me. applying it to a book. To yeah, to I love that story. By the way, is this Luca on the cover? <laughs> Do people say that? It I looks like Luca. I have two clients. The people are like, it's got to be him, or I've gotten is that Luca? Well, this guy's yeah. jacked. Minus the. Uh, is it the one of those guys? No, no. Oh, okay, it's, it's just a, a random guy. It's a stock photo that I was like, this is perfect. Really? Yeah. Oh my goodness! Like Luca the tattoos. That's great. Uh, so, so tell us like about the book now. Tell us all about like what's in this book. Because you guys, uh, Mike's a fascinating person. He's committed to helping people. It's proven that I actually know some of the people he's worked with, and they rave about him. Um, tell us about the book, Mike. The the book was, you know, originally it's it's kind of uh, structured or, or skeleton in a way of of three parts and the three parts are, are really uh, me honoring my father right so nice. the, the intro to each nice. three parts is a story about me, my father passing away and me honoring his final wish mm -hmm. and then in between I talk about uh, all of the coaching that I do and have received over since this you know since my being a teenager 
all the elders that I've met and everything that I've done, that for me, like, here's the blueprint of a lot of what we're talking about, really shifting life to, from one dimension to dynamic, from success to fulfillment. And then here's the skeleton and the framework of how to build that in, in our lives. Mm -hmm. What are the principles we live by? What are the narratives that we challenge? What are the ways that we're showing up in our relationships, in our marriages? The things that we really have to take an honest reflection of, of what's no longer working mm -hmm. or what paradigms have we outgrown? Right. You know, you were mentioning before about this cultural narrative that we have of men is like, don't show your emotions. Don't, you know, don't let them see you sweat. Don't let X, Y, and Z. And we, we, we just cloud all that or, or gather all that into, you know what? Be a man. And there's kind of broad, a little broad yeah, yeah. and like, oh, uh, what kind of man am mm -hmm. I actually, you know, trying to be here? And so in here, I, I, I invite the reader into a, a new paradigm of a man, mm -hmm. a man that is dynamic, a man that lives by his commitments, a man that lives by his principles, a man that leads himself, leads his, his relationships, mm -hmm. leads his community. That's an impact. That's a contribution. And these are all the things that I've learned over decades of work and decades of coaching that I think as, as more and more men wake up and, and, uh, and are invited to this new paradigm, uh, we create a whole new possibility for our finances, for our freedom, for our relationships, for our communities. And it starts like you, you and I have been saying, it, it starts with me. Mm. It starts with me willing to do the work, to look inside myself and say, this isn't working. I need to correct it, adjust it, evolve it so that I can be a better example, a better brother, a better husband, a better father, a better leader in my life. And that's how we're going to create this ripple effect because all the way back to the beginning, you never know who's watching. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome summary. So where can they get this book, Mike? Books on Amazon. Amazon. New, yeah, New Man Emerging. You guys might have Amazon. heard of it. Amazon. Um, <laughs> also... Tell us, um, young, I shouldn't say that, anyone, if you could give a piece of advice to anyone struggling with something, uh, their come up, their path, their journey, there's a lot of anxiety, maybe confusion, maybe even depression. Mm. I know it's super broad, but what advice would you give to someone who's struggling and trying to find their way? And I know that's basically a microcosm of your group. Yeah. But if you could just give out some free advice <laughs> to uh, this, our listeners who, you know, everyone is trying to evolve. I think, I really believe that most are trying to evolve. They may not know it yet, but they want to grow. They want to develop themselves. What advice would you give them? Hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think ultimately is you got this that's ultimately the encouragement that i think we all at one point in our lives need to hear mm. is you've got this you've got what it takes and one of the lies that i think that we were sold or taught or whatever is i, I can't be happy with this but i will be happy with that and you've got this right here right now You've got it. You've got everything that it takes right here, right now. It may require some discipline, some commitment, some strengthening, some mm -hmm, mm -hmm. adding, some subtracting, mm -hmm. but everything you need to be in this moment right now, you've got it. You've got it. You get to choose it. You get to choose it over and over and over again until you create the outcomes that you want. But right now, take a deep breath, pause for a moment, and remind yourself, I got this. I love that. I love that. Um, very similar uh, advice I, I would give to myself many days. I mean it, many days. Like you know, And I think there's a lot of power in what you just said. Like some, you know, the conversations you have with yourself are the most important. Yeah. You know, if you tell yourself you can't do something or you create scenarios in your head, you're going to have a big problem. Yeah. You know, just one foot in front of the other, be where your feet are at, and that's yeah. it, really. Yeah. Those narratives create behaviors, so oh, make yeah. sure you're choosing the right, you know, make oh, sure you're yeah. choosing the healthy ones. I love that. I love that. So in regards to your, why don't we give everyone, thank you for being on. It was incredible. My I pleasure. mean, thank you so much. It was really great. I mean, you My pleasure. I'm going to have to, I'm going to listen to it, obviously, and, and take a bunch of notes because there was several gems in this. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and once again, I want to say this again. I've talked to several people who have worked with Mike, and they are ultra happy and rave about Mike. Uh, in the most positive way. And it doesn't mean he has all the answers, but he definitely knows how to guide people. And I think that that's the most powerful thing going, really. Agreed. Agreed, man. I have the answers for me. Yeah. <laughs> but I always invite you know, my, my people. The answers are within you. You've got it. Let's just clear off the roadblocks that are in the way. It's beautiful. So how can people find you, Mike? And how can they learn more about your retreats why don't you uh, tell the listeners how they can get in uh, touch with you you can find me on michaeldesanti.com and on there you'll see uh, the men's groups for find your tribe mm-hmm. and you can follow me on instagram mike underscore desanti and that's where I promote uh, some of the retreats and okay. things like that but michaeldesanti.com has, has everything on there and then uh, the book new man emerging is on amazon and thank you so much if I want to visit Montana do I have to get in the group to now, you, experience you, it the right way? Shoot me a text later. The right well, way. Well, let's get you there. <laughs> the, the now, right you, way. You, you, let's get you there. I told my wife, no more cities. We're going to go to the woods. <laughs> We're going to be in the woods. We're going to do it. Thank God. I don't have to twist my wife's arm ever to get, get to get out to the wilderness. So thank God. Sounds beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks I can't thank you me, enough. And you guys, it. check out Mike's book, New Man Emerging. And uh, we're going to put this up and, and get a lot of traction here. So appreciate you appreciate your powerful energy and appreciate you being here obviously thank you so much thank you man appreciate your friendship